Hi, I'm Alex L., and I write books for a living. The Hey Girl podcast was created with sisterhood and storytelling in mind. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. (laughs) I'll be sitting down with some phenomenal women to discuss love. I believe we grew distant out of love of some type. Like, I don't want to hurt you. Loss. Really don't know what's going to trigger that feeling of grief in any moment. And a topic very important to my work self-care. Freedom is self-care. It's not about pedicures. It's not about clothing. It's not about trips. Join us as we journey through sharing together. Today on the show, I have one of my favorite poets. Her name is Pavana Reddy, and she's the author of Rengoli. I've been a fan of her work for years now, dating all the way back to 2013. Watching her bloom and grow in her artistry has been a true honor. And being able to sit down with her today to learn a little bit more about her story, her ritual, and her writing practice was quite the treat. Here's Pavana's story. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hi, Pavana. I'm so happy that you're here. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here, too. This um, has been a long time coming. I knew that when I got back into the studio for 2019, I needed you to be on the list of guests. So I truly am thrilled and and honored to have you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this, too. I'm so happy to be here. So before we dive into our conversation, I would love for you to introduce yourself to the Hey Girl listeners. So... Who are you and what do you do? Uh, My name is Pavana Reddy. I'm known on social media as Maza Doda. I am a poet and writer that lives in Los Angeles, California. So I've been a fan of your work for years now. I can't even recall when I discovered you it might have been on tumblr um which was a very long time ago i haven't been on that platform in years i know it's been so long i know um but your work and your ability to unfold into your truth through poetry has always resonated with me um there's just something really magical about how you string words together so I want to get this conversation started by asking you how poetry found you, how writing found you, and what purpose has it served in your life up to this point? Oh, wow. Poetry has been such a journey for me. Um, I I honestly started writing very young. It was my way of, you know, before I, I was always such a loner as a kid. I was always that one that wanted to be hidden away with a book and ignore my other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So I was that little girl that would just go find books that nobody else has read, and um, that kind of branched out into poetry. Like, I I found a book. um, It was by an Indian poet named Sarojini Naidu. I started reading her, and I was just taken away by her imagery and the art of poetry that she preserved. It was just like, it was like almost being taken back in time. And that really just stuck with me, and I wanted to try my attempt to be like, you know, I want to be able to evoke that same imagery with my writing. And that's where I started. You know, I started with like really, really descriptive and like over the top and kind of just fine tune it over the years. And what really kept me going um, initially was when I mean, I was 11 years old when I lost my older sister. Mm -hmm. And that really, really shaped me as a writer it became more as not a, a not necessarily a way to be a better writer, but more as a way for me to escape into myself and heal on my own because I had these questions. I didn't know how to ask them. I didn't have those resources, like people to reach out to. The only way I knew how to handle that grief was through writing and doing that on my own. And um, throughout the years, like it took me a while to even start sharing my work. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember on Tumblr when I was, the whole reason I did the whole Mazda Dota um, username was because I was scared. I didn't want people to know that I was the one writing these poems. And when I found, when I saw the response, especially the response from younger girls who were like, you know, they felt like they related to some of the poems, that was when I started to feel less alone. 
You know, I had these girls telling me, like, oh, my God, thank you for your work. And I'm sitting here alone in my, you know, little room just thinking I'm alone in these feelings mm-hmm. and I'm being told, no, you're not. And that really, really fed my passion even more. I was like, no, there are other girls out here that are dealing with grief. Mm-hmm. And if this can help them, like, a little bit, then I'm going to continue doing it. And that, so writing now has, like, morphed into this. It doesn't necessarily... I think before when I, like, published my first book, I was thinking maybe this could be a career. Maybe I can make my life out of this, you know, all that stuff. But it really, really brought me back to myself these last two years. So I was like, no, that's not the motivation. Go back to why you started. Mm. Go back to why you started sharing your work and continue doing that. Everything else is noise. Mm -hmm. You know, like, all the other stuff is just confetti. But the message that you're leaving with, you know, like imagining myself as that kid, that's what I'm writing to. And so that's what poetry is to me these days. And that's all I'm trying to preserve. And it's been pretty eye opening just mm. being, <laughs> cause poetry these days, it's like, there's so much of it. And you know, they're beautiful. It's saturated, but I'm still trying to preserve my little like peace in that noise. I think that's really important that you just stated that because now with the boom of social media, everybody can be what they want to be, who they Mm -hmm. want to be in their careers, in how they present themselves. Um, We can reach massive audiences, right? And I think that there can be such a blessing in social media with community building and all of that, but Mm -hmm. for us as artists, as writers, um, as poets, as essayists, photographers, all the things. It's like, mm-hmm. how do we stay rooted and grounded in our our art form and not get distracted by the noise? And I, mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you brought that up because it's so easy to do that. I mean, you were able to build these large followings and reach people who may not be able to come to our book signings or... There's so many different reasons why we can build community online, but like really keeping true to what our mm-hmm. work is, not only online, but offline is super just important and valid. And I wish more folks had that mentality. So I want to ask, what has writing just in general taught you about community? If we had to remove social media from the narrative, how have you found your community through written work? Oh, that's also <laughs> been a journey. <laughs> because the other, the, um, while social media has been great and you meet great people, it's also very filtering. You know, you meet people and you're just like, okay, do you want something from me? Or is mm-hmm. there a genuine connection here? Mm-hmm. And so I've learned with social media is that when, you know, someone I admire hits me up, I don't go crazy. I'm not like, oh my God, like, you know, <laughs> this is amazing. I've learned definitely through the years that everyone is out here doing their own thing trying to be heard you know and everyone just wants respect and when I what I've realized um when it comes to writing is that it attracts a certain crowd of people that you know and I think a lot of creatives get this they they attract a certain amount of people that want to get to know you they want to know you but they don't want to know you if Mm -hmm. that makes sense it does so I've learned through the years I've met some of the most genuine people through writing, um, through what I do, through that community, going to book releases, doing all that. And um, again, with all the noise, there's so much noise surrounding that. But writing has really helped me like hone in on that community and definitely taught me how much smaller it is than I initially had thought. But that that small little comfort is kind of like a home to me and um, I think my writing has really helped me find that but uh, that's definitely been outside of social media it hasn't been with social media <laughs> social media has taken me in a different direction I was like no 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 that's, right. not, my <laughs> <laughs> that's not my lane um, yeah <laughs> so to shift gears just a little bit can you give us some background on your family and 
your relationship with your mom because I know she designed the cover of your first book, which is just Mm -hmm. stunning. And also the mending that had to happen after the loss of your sister. Okay, so the first book was very, very, very difficult to write because there were stories in there that, you know, I come from a very secretive family. I don't know if that's the, if that's the word I should use. It's more of a family that is used to keeping things inside. You know, we don't tell people what happens. Mm-hmm. And for me, and I come from a family of scientists, so none of their work, you know, has to reflect on these feelings and then you got me a little black sheep who's the poet in the family <laughs> writing about everything you know um and it, it took a lot of time took a lot of patience took a lot of sitting with my mom and like showing her the work and having her you know and, and talking to her and that process itself definitely brought us so much closer and when I um and when I had asked her to do the cover this was hilarious. There's a whole story behind that cover where I had, you know, used another artist and that artist ended up falling through. And it was maybe two weeks before my book release where everything kind of just hit the fan and I didn't have a cover anymore. So I took the book to my mom's house and I was like, I told her everything that happened. And she looked at me and she was like, Taz, I've been, how long have I been drawing? And my mom's been an artist for the longest time. And she was like, and you didn't even come to me. Why did you come to me? And so I kind of looked at her. I'm like, I didn't know if that was something you'd be okay with. And she was like, absolutely. This is your first book. This is our first baby. I will do the art for you. Mm. And she did it. The cover, the, the book itself, Rangoli, is um, the name Rangoli is an Indian design. It's an art form made with colorful sand it's all symmetrical and you usually do it outside of a home like a new home or a new space that you're about to enter to bless it Mm. and I grew up watching my mom do this in all the homes that we lived in because we moved around a lot and I figured I was like this is a story about us and we're basically welcoming people into our home with this book so it's it's only most fitting if you do run only for the book and so she did she did it in her backyard we took a photo inverted the colors and that was the cover Oh my goodness. In a day. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> I know. It was it, the way everything fell into place was just so beautiful and magical. You mentioned earlier the loss of your sister at age 11. And I wonder how that immense loss shaped you not only as a writer, but as a woman and how you move through the world, especially as a woman of color. Can you talk about that a little bit if you're comfortable? Sure, sure. Well, experiencing a loss like that at 11 makes you grow up really fast. Mm. Um, I do remember being 11 years old and having to, I mean, my brother, I also have a younger brother. He's three years younger than me. So he was kind of a baby when it happened. But the, the responsibility kind of fell on my shoulders at a young age where I had to make sure that my mom was okay. I had to make sure my brother was okay. And it was, Nothing like now that I regret. I'm I'm so happy that I was able to do that mm-hmm. because I see where my family is now. So for me to that loss is like it just sits in your chest and it never goes away. It's something that I deal with every day. There's some days that it's harder. Some days it's easy. And she's always like that little voice in my head that I'm talking to. Mm-hmm. There's like a source of comfort but also constant pain in that lesson and it's almost like a lesson that never ends like every day it teaches you something new and I try to hone that in on my writing and that's how I deal with it it's almost like I can't escape it Mm. like everything that I do when it comes to art has to be a reflection of that in some way and that just tells you that you can't ever get over some losses so to transition back to to writing Mm -hmm. Being a woman of color, being an Indian woman in this realm of writing, what is that teaching you about finding your own unique voice? Being a woman of color writer is so beautiful because we have so many experiences to pull from. You know, we have so many things that happen to us every day and being able to write that in a way that others can relate to not just that but maybe 
non-people of color can read and be like, oh, wait, I understand this perspective has been great. Mm. You know, it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been a learning experience. And I, I've loved it. On the other hand, I think there comes a point where after a while, people expect you to be writing a certain way if you're a person of color or mm. a woman of color. Mm-hmm. There, I've, I've been told, you know, the whole publishing um, journey has been interesting too. I've been told by publishers, you know, we need this to be a little bit more Indian. Mm. <laughs> and my and, and my my answer is like, how how do I make this more Indian? I am Indian, mm-hmm. and this is my story. So why can't my story just be outside of trauma? Why can't my story just be about this Indian girl who grew up in California? Mm-hmm. And that's my experience. Um, so I feel like there's a pressure on, especially on women of color, to always be writing to this pain and to this trauma and to be displaying it, Mm -hmm. but nothing's really happening. Nothing's really changing. You know, it's almost like we just need this because it's popular, Mm. not because it's not because we're learning. So for me to, to be able to write that way has to have like a certain story or specific message because it's really hard to write to that pain for an audience who just wants to see it. Right, right. And I feel that, and I don't think people, especially women of color, I don't think people really respect that because I, I will I will say this, even men of color, what are they writing about? They're writing about women of color. Mm. And it just, it, it gets to the point where you're just like, okay, come on, just let us breathe. Mm-hmm. Let us exist the way we want to. You don't need to be writing about our trauma or asking us to write about it. Like that's not all we are. Shine is a free self-care app that will help you say, I got this, every morning. Each day, you get motivational texts and audio clips tailored toward your personal goals. Shine will help you grow and be kind to yourself along the way. Think of it like a personalized pep talk, but in your pocket. I love waking up to Shine's texts in the mornings. They're motivational, uplifting, and can really help me kickstart my day on a positive note. Shine's motivational texts make me feel like I can run my day. One of my favorite Shine features is the check-in option. They send a prompt, and I'm huge on prompts, asking about gratitude. What am I grateful for today? That's a question that I ask daily during my own writing practice. So to have it come straight to my phone as a reminder is awesome. And if you're into meditation and affirmations, Shine has something for that too. Why is the Shine app so awesome? Well, for one, it's a great way to start your day. If you ever feel anxious or overwhelmed before you get going, every weekday morning, Shine sends you a motivational text to help you hustle with your heart. Over 3 million people in 189 countries start their morning with Shine. If you're interested in giving it a try, download the Shine app today at the App Store or on Google Play and go to shinetext.com slash heygirl to get 50% off Shine Premium. You'll get access to the entire Shine audio library and enjoy other exclusive features. That's shinetext.com slash heygirl to get 50% off Shine Premium. Again, that's shinetext.com slash heygirl, S-H-I-N-E-T-E-X-T dot com slash heygirl. I'm so glad you said that because when I wrote Neon Soul, which is my third collection, of poetry Mm -hmm. in the beginning in the intro you know I said something along the lines of healing from hurt is just as important as preparing for joy or something along those Mm -hmm. lines and because I didn't want to write about heartbreak I didn't want to write about daddy issues I didn't want to write about being a black unwed teen mother I didn't want to write about my trauma anymore I had been there and I had to write about it at one point I had to address Mm -hmm. it at one point But okay, I'm growing. And like you said, the more we stay in our trauma and continue and are expected to like kind of live there, Mm -hmm. how are we supposed to grow? So I think that's really pivotal for folks to understand that, yes, trauma and yes, healing, right? So we can Mm -hmm. 
exist. The duality can exist together. And I'm glad that you've found your belonging in not only addressing your trauma, but then being like, okay, next chapter. Mm -hmm. Because that's magic. So publishing, you self-published Rangoli and Mm -hmm. you're also self-publishing your next collection that's coming out, which I'm very excited Mm -hmm. for. How has that been for you being being self-published? I was self-published as well. And then my third collection and my new journal is now with a traditional publisher. And we've had our side conversations about the pros and cons of, of both. So what lessons have you learned through publishing and also naming your worth and standing in it? Oh, man, the publishing journey has been fun. So eye opening. I've definitely learned a lot about rejection and just accepting it as just that. It doesn't mean your work is bad. It just means it's not what they're looking for. That's fine. And sometimes publishers will be like, this isn't what I'm looking for. Can you do this instead? Mm. And for me, that was the biggest thing where I'm just like, I, I, what are you trying to, are you trying to publish a book that's already been published? Mm-hmm. Because that's not what I want to fall into. And so for me, while I've been going through the publishing process, like looking for someone that I, that would respect the work, you know, not necessarily the image where Mm -hmm. it's like, look, I like your work. Let's do something with this. That has been my only desire for for this whole journey. The reason I self-published the first book in this one is because I couldn't find that. I couldn't find a publisher that was like, hey, your work is beautiful. Let's work together. Instead, I've been dealing with write me a book and we keep all the royalties, but we'll put it in Target. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, those are the types that's the world out there that is reality I've never I haven't had that experience and I'm really not happy that you've had that experience because that is yeah it ridiculous it was it was shocking because they were one of the biggest publishers in North America that were telling me this mm. so and that but that's also a reflection of social media yeah. it's also a reflection of what is popular now mm-hmm. and so you know publishers are trying to take advantage of that it's a game again yeah um So for me, I just really had to, you know, keep reminding myself, don't start looking down on yourself. Your work stands for itself. You worked hard to get here. And the reason publishers are even looking at you is because they see your work. Mm -hmm. And I have to keep reminding myself that. And I was like, look, I I don't mind self-publishing again. It takes a lot of work. You know, you do everything on your own. But maybe down the line, someone who respects it will pick it up. And if that happens, I would be so happy. But until then, I would rather my work just be as pure as it can be and untainted by um, someone who just wants to make a dollar off of it. Mm. And I'm happy with that for now. As, As a creative and a woman who writes truth for a living, how do you intertwine self-care in your writing practice when you're writing just for you and not for a book or for a social media share or to read at a signing? How are you Mm -hmm. practicing taking care of just nurturing your heart's language? You know, when I mentioned how poetry kind of spoke to me at an early age, with this poet that I read who evoked such imagery. For me, whenever I would sit down to write a poem at that age, I was always so excited to escape into that world, Mm. that world where I could be like, let me imagine myself in this moment that was so magical to me and pull from that. So when I sit down and I want to write about something that I'm not going to share or I don't have, that's not in my head. It's not like I'm writing for a book. I'm just writing to write. For me, that self-care is like going into that quiet space and taking my mind back into that moment and living in that moment and trying to draw it again with words. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the most comforting feeling. It could literally be a moment. It could be a moment where I'm like with someone that I really care about you know, and just like going, escaping back into that. And for me, a lot of people laugh at me for this, but I can do this anywhere. I could do this in the DMV, you know, like for me, writing has been that escape Mm -hmm. and my self-care has allowing that because so much of my life has been responsibility, you know, 
growing up fast, taking care of things. I, I for the longest time I really stopped forgetting how to escape within myself. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I named the second collection Where Do You Go Alone? Because that's where I go alone. That mm. is my self care. Mm. I think that's a great way to end. Thank you so much. Before you go, we have a little something special. I'm excited to share that Pavana read two of her poems for us. Stay tuned to hear them. The first poem is from Rangoli, and it is untitled. You will become a graveyard of all the women you once were. Before you rise one morning, embraced by your own skin, you will swallow a thousand different names before you taste the meaning held within your own. This poem is also entitled, and it's from my second collection, Where Do You Go Alone? Teach him to never claim where he has still yet to learn. Men will chart and map our bodies as if we haven't lived there our entire lives. When he leaves, Make sure you know your way back to yourself. I hope you remember to keep a light on. And before you ever let another inside, remind yourself. If you must fall in love with a stranger, let it first be with yourself. The Hey Girl Podcast is a member of The District Productive. Produced by Paul, Woody Woodhall, and me, Alex L. Music by DC's own Kokai. Kokai.